Good morning, everyone. I'm Jonathan Little. I want to thank you for being here today. It is Sunday, a special Sunday edition of A Little Coffee. Lady Nomok, right in the chat. Hello, hello. You must have been waiting. We have coffee today. Thanks to um, Starbucks Coffee. They're right downstairs. So when I came to Baja Mar last time, I loved going to the Regatta Buffet every single morning. It was great, quick, easy, efficient. It was good. Um, however, they, well, Party Poker gave, included breakfast at the Regatta Buffet to everyone who satellited in, or most people who satellited in. So I went down there to, yesterday. The line was out the door at 8 a.m. and at 11 a.m., at 10.30 a.m., then today, I went down there at 8 a.m., line out the door, so I have to find something different for breakfast. So I had a breakfast sandwich from Starbucks. It's not the ideal way that I would like to start my day, but I'll have that and some green smoothie mix, and we will be good to go. So that's all good and exciting. If you put it in a, in a real coffee cup, it tastes just as good. <laughs> so today, we're sort of doing a remake of um, what... We talked about the other day whenever I, my internet did not work. The internet just continuously failed. So today we're going to talk about image and, um, you know, I guess profiling in general. What's my favorite type of coffee? I like Cafe Du Monde coffee when I'm at home. They put bark in it and um, it, it makes you hopelessly addicted to it forever and no other coffee tastes the same. So Cafe Du Monde coffee, if you're out there, I'll take as many as you would like. Cafe Du Monde is, I guess it's a well, cafe in New Orleans, and they have beignets, but they also have coffee. Man, what's this stuff called? What's the bark called? I'm blanking on it right now. So funny how your brain just doesn't work. Starts with a C, I think. Whatever. Special coffee. Give it a try. I'm sure someone out there is hopelessly addicted as well, and um, you all know what I'm talking about. Earl Grey tea, hot, medium, sweet. Oh, I do no sugar. Absolutely no sugar. Um, I'm not necessarily against sugar, but chicory. There we go. I knew someone knew it. Frogman Matt. Frogman Matt knew chicory. That's what it's called. And that is accurate. Um, I don't really do any sugar. Nothing like that. I try to not do milk. If, if, the, if the tea is... If the tea or coffee is good in my mind, I don't need to um, add things to it. I, I don't, we don't need milk. We don't need sugar. We don't need um, cinnamon. We don't need chocolate. We just need the coffee if the coffee is good. And uh, Cafe Du Monde coffee is excellent. You can drink it with nothing in it, no problem. And, you know, Starbucks coffee is fine. Kevin says, no, you use stevia. Stevia is a form of... Not sugar, but it's a form of sweetener. Why do you need it sweet? I would just ask you why. Whenever I met my wife, she would add all sorts of stuff to her coffee. She would only get the, the horrible for you coffee. And now she drinks it black. Go figure. Or with a touch of milk. <laughs> um, where are the comments coming from? From you all. Comments are coming from Instagram on my phone right up here. And then right here. Two different devices here. Um, Twitter. And Twitter, Facebook, Twitch, Twitter, Facebook, Twitch, YouTube, I feel like I'm forgetting one. Maybe that's it. Yeah, I think that's it. Then we have Facebook over here. Facebook's on the side. They have a separate chat. I am amazing. Thank you. I don't feel amazing, but I try to be amazing. You're trying to win at small stakes, but people play any two cards. You had 20 big blinds with ace-king of hearts, and there's a raise and two callers. You were in the small blind. Go all in. Easy all in. Whenever you're playing 20 big blinds deep, if there is a raise in front of you at all, your only options are to go all in or fold. Periscope. Frog, Frogman Matt says Periscope. Yeah, Periscope is, um, I, I link that with Twitter, but I guess they are different, right? I know if I post on Periscope, it automatically goes to Twitter. Um, okay, so, but yeah, so that's the spot where you just shove. You're happy to shove. The guy calls with 5-2 and you get it in good. You're thrilled. You just made a ton of money. Well, you didn't make a ton of money. Let's say you have, um, I don't know how much equity you have. Let's say you have 42% equity and you put in 
20 big blinds, if he put in 20 big blinds, and there's, let's say, five big blinds dead in the pot, means the pot's 45 big blinds, and you own, I don't know, let's call it, let's call it 60% equity, let's just make life easy. It means there's 45 in there, and you own 60% of that. Now, I don't know what that is, but let's say it's uh, 24. It means you put in 20, you get back 24, and you make four or five big blinds. That's a huge amount of profit, and you should be very, very happy with that. That's just printing money, and, and you can't do much better than that. Now, of course, you're going to lose sometimes, but that doesn't matter. Winning and losing does not matter, which is vitally important for everyone to understand. A lot of people think that the goal is to um, win hands, but the goal is actually to win equity. If you win equity over and over and over and over and over again, you're going to profit a huge amount in the long run. It really is as simple as that. So win equity over and over and over. My phone must have a bad signal. Instagram is laggy. Well, if Instagram's laggy, everyone there, please go join me on Twitter, Twitch, YouTube, or Facebook. We're there as well. It is a different device. Maybe it's laggy. I don't know. Am I going to publish a book about mixed games? Well, I'm personally not a mixed game pro, and I would never publish a book about anything I did not feel very, very confident at. So the answer to that is absolutely not. However, my publisher, DNB Poker, is publishing a book on mixed games. And that should be coming out, ideally, during this World Series. Everyone on Instagram is saying Instagram's working fine. Well, good. Should you learn to play other games like Stud to improve your hold'em and other game skills? I personally think no. I think it's not a good idea. In general, unless you have already found a game that you can beat consistently for decent results... You know, like, if, if you're, if you, once you have a game that you can beat consistently, that's when you start, need to start branching out, in my opinion. Maybe that's because I'm biased. I started playing Sit and Goes when I was young. Actually, I started playing Limit Hold'em. I turned $50 into 20000 or so playing Limit Hold'em. And then I moved to Sit and Goes because there were no bigger Limit games. And from there, I just played Sit and Goes for like three years, right? So that is how I progressed. That is what I did to succeed at poker. Now, that's not what everyone does. I know a lot of people jump around. But I think if you look at the biggest winners in the game today, they all started with a game that they could consistently beat for a large amount of money. And they played that as much as they possibly can. And then they got a ton of money. And once you have a ton of money, or you have a game that you can know you can go back to to get a ton of money, everything else is just kind of easy because you're never under financial strain. And I think the idea of I'm going to play No Limit Hold'em on Monday and Stud on Tuesday and Raz on Wednesday, it's like, what are you doing? You're not going to learn quickly. You're going to be mediocre at a lot of stuff. And being mediocre at a lot of stuff is just a way to be mediocre. What do I say is the best math book? That's a difficult question. You really don't need much math to be great at poker, in my opinion. You need some. And if you want to study the game very, very deeply, you need some. But the thing, the great thing about today is a lot of people have done the work already to where you don't actually have to do a ton of work because it's already been done, right? The hard math has already been done for you. And now there are programs that can do the hard math for you. So um, you don't really need a ton. Everything I mentioned in Mastering Small Stakes and No Limit Hold'em is all you need. It's not, it's not a lot. It's like algebra, right? Now, if you want to go in depth, I would tell you to get... Expert Heads Up No Limit Hold'em. It's a very good book. It's a, it's a dense book. It's a difficult book, but that's what I would suggest. Expert Heads Up No Limit Hold'em. <laughs> Hello from New York. Hello. It's where I live now. Why is it the one can win at tournaments but lose online? I presume you mean why are people winning live but losing online? It's because online poker is tougher than live poker. It's definitely proven, definitively proven, that online poker is more difficult for many reasons. We've discussed this in the past. Essentially, people play many more hands because they, they just go way faster. They can play many more tables, and that weeds out the bad players. Therefore, there are fewer bad players. If there are fewer bad players, if you're not a great player and you hop into a very difficult game, you're just going to get crushed. Whereas in live poker, a lot of people, they go and they play one time a week, and they lose 200 bucks and they don't care. But if you lose $200... Every time you play online, whenever you buy into a game, which means if you're playing four tables, you're losing 800 bucks a day. 800 bucks a day is a lot of money. Well, you're going to quit really soon. Or you're going to get good. Where can you watch the 25K High Roller? I don't know of their exact streaming schedule, but I know you can watch it at PartyPokerLive.com. I think that's it. I posted it in my Twitter yesterday. So go to Twitter, at Jonathan Little. 
and um, you'll you'll see my post where I posted about it. What's my favorite casino in New York? I don't I don't play in casinos in New York. Um, with any luck, I'll be on the on the feature table today. Uh, the, what the way they figure out the feature table is they pick a good table and they let them be there for two hours. And if they're streaming for either eight or six hours today, that means that I'm one in however many to get to get pulled. I did not get pulled on day one, so maybe we'll be on there on day two. We'll see. All right, back to image. I'm trying to figure out how to, the best way to go about discussing image because you can really go a few ways. Um, let's first talk about our own image. Actually, no, let's talk about our opponent's image. When you show up at the table and you look around, what do you see? Well, in the 25K the other day when I showed up, I saw a good player in seat one, someone who I knew to be a wealthy recreational player in seat two, two other good pros, another good pro, a kid I did not know, and a good pro. Okay? So we have one person I know, know is recreational. I don't know if that person is good or bad at all. I don't know. I've never played with her. And then we have another guy who I've never seen in my life. Okay. The guy I'd never seen in my life, after observing him for three or four hours, he did not play very many hands. He was playing very, very tight. That led me to believe he either was probably just not so good, or he satellited in. He did not speak English very well, or he didn't, didn't speak English, <laughs> one of the two. And that's worth noting, right? And I actually played a hand very differently against him than I would have against uh, one of the other people who I know to be good pros because later he, he'd just been tight, right? And if he's being tight and he's not messing around, if he wants to bluff me, he gets to bluff me. Congratulations. So that kind of thing is important. If you don't know them, well, first off, if you play a lot at a local place, and you don't know someone, what does that imply? That implies that person does not play a lot where you play. It doesn't necessarily imply they don't play. It just implies they don't play where you play. Um, so, But if someone like strolls in for the random Thursday night $120 tournament and you don't know them, they're probably just looking to gamble. Or maybe they're, they're very, very new and they're, they're trying to get involved. But they're probably more novice than someone who plays every single day. Unless that person who plays every single day is clearly bad and you know they're bad. What's some reasonable amount of time to label someone? Um, zero hands. So, for example, given I did not know the kid, the one who probably satellited in, I sort of assumed that he probably satellited in, or he's a very good online player, who I just don't know. He looked young. He was probably 22 or something. So, one of those two things is almost certainly true. Either he satellited in, or... He's a good online player. So I know one of those things to be very, very true, and those things are very dif uh, different, right? But with playing with him after, I don't know, a while, 30 minutes, I started to get the vibe. The guy's probably just on the tight side, which is fine. You can be good and tight. But after a while longer, he was still tight. Well, that was just probably really nitty. Um, the recreational player in the two-seat, who I'd never played with, I knew she was a... Um, she plays very high roller tournaments, and, um, you know, she's playing reasonably. But at the same time, I saw her slightly overvaluing some hands, um, maybe playing, at least in my mind, a little bit, I'm going to say, obviously straightforward. I mean, there's a spot where I folded trips to her. I don't fold trips very often, but I folded trips. But just because I didn't think she was going to be running a big bluff. And you know, if she did bluff me, good job. But I'm thinking more often than not in that spot, whenever um, the flush comes on the turn and she blasts it, and then, then the, the board doesn't change it on the river and she blasts it, she probably has a flush or a boat. Um... That said, maybe she just bluffed me. I don't know. That's the thing about profiling and trying to figure out what your opponents are doing is that you are going to make wrong assessments. And the thing is, a lot of people are very uncomfortable with the idea of, I'm going to make a play, I'm going to risk significant money, and I don't know if I'm right. Sometimes you don't know if you're right. And it's okay. But if you are more right than you are wrong, you're going to be winning money in the long run. And I think a lot of the best players are very good at adjusting ahead of time to what they expect to have happen. Um, so, anyway, you go to the table. You see, say, Imagine you see someone wearing a bunch of gaudy jewelry and chatting up everybody and throwing their chips in the pot and playing every hand. Well, that player's probably going to be on the loose and the aggressive, or at least the loose side. Maybe not necessarily aggressive, but at least loose. Say you see a guy wearing a business suit who's not talking to anyone, who seems out of place, who plays one hand in the first 30 minutes, well, that player's probably on the tight side, right? I mean, 
A lot of this stuff is just common sense. You can um you can definitely think about general um, location demographics like people in the northeast, in the New York area, like in Borgata. A lot of those players really like to get in there and have ego battles. I don't know why. It just seems like that's what they do. In in the southeast America, a lot of people are at least the, the southern part, not the not the Miami part. The southern part, a lot of people are just loose and kind of passive. I don't know why. They just are. And knowing these things will be very beneficial. I mean, if you watch uh, a lot of the um, streamers online who do private streams just for their you know their students, where they're being brutally honest, they will often say people from this specific country are not good across the board. And there's I mean that there's obviously exceptions to every rule, of course, but. If you know everyone from a specific country is just straight up bad, then, you know, you want to be playing hands with those people in general when you run into them if you don't know them. And there are some countries where people are just good. Like, uh, imagine there's a country where there's not a whole lot of money in that country, yet you see a, a decent amount of high-stakes pros from that country. What does that imply? That implies very often they had to come up farther than people who came from a country that is uh, very wealthy, Right? So that often implies that those players typically are very, very strong. They're not just lucky or, or rich because no one is rich from those places. All right. Daniel says, people feel they need to get it right every single time. Otherwise, they're not going to adjust. Yeah, I mean, and that is certainly true. Does the big blind Andy slightly change strategy? Only when you get shallow. I will tell you a spot where it changed strategy. Um... I had 8-7 offsuit under the gun in Montreal with five big blinds. I got I had just lost a big hand where I had top pair against a set from a, a loose player named Pesh. And I was left with five big blinds in the hijack seat. So I looked down, I get 7-2 offsuit, I fold. I got 9-2 offsuit, I fold. I got like queen 2 offsuit, and I folded. Now I'm under the gun. Maybe I should have jammed the queen 2, actually. I'm under the gun with 8-7, five big blinds, with a big blind ante next hand. So... Um, do I shove the 8-7? Well, if you look at a push-fold chart, and if you consider ICM at all, it seems like an easy fold if there is no big blind ante. But with a big blind ante, if I know I'm going to have to put in 20% of my stack dead next hand, yeah, I need to go with the 8-7 offsuit. And a few people said, why would you go with 8-7 offsuit? It's not on your push-fold app. Well, again, push-fold apps do not account for payout implications, which are very vital. I was by far the shortest stack. And... Big blind ante exists. And the cool thing is, is we don't really know how to calculate big blind ante yet, how that impacts the game. I have one of my friends who's very good at math. He made one of the poker bots that played heads up. He's currently working on it. The problem is you have to assume what's called future game simulations. ICMizer does this a little bit. And it, it, they even say that they, they're getting it wrong. They're, they're having a hard time getting this right. Because it, you have to essentially assume what's going to happen on average on the next hand and the next hand and the next hand and the next hand. And how far out do you go, right? Do you go out 20 hands, 50 hands? And that changes the calculation. It makes the calculation very big. So big blind ante is not solved. You can do your best with it. But basically, if you know you're going to lose, 20% of your stack is just gone. You have 0% equity in it. You better be jamming pretty wide when you're in the early positions, when you're shallow. All right, now let's think about our image. <sighs> what do you look like? How do you appear? How do you dress? How do you act? How do you... Handle yourself. These are all very important things. Like imagine you show up to the table and you stack your chips in stacks of five and you say, I'm going to call and then raise 54. You know, like imagine you have someone who's obviously, obviously amateur with their mannerisms. You can be very confident that that player is going to be an amateur. It just is what it is. And it's okay for people to be amateur, but it's also important for you to understand that you're going to make money because these players are recreational. Now, you can maybe um, try to act amateur. Some people do this. I, I try to act dumb sometimes, although it's clearly it's kind of silly for me at this point in life because most, most people know me. And once you understand... I guess I should talk about myself personally. Um, maybe five or six years ago, something like 20% of the people in poker rooms knew me, which is some, but not a ton. And if I went to more and more uh, local casinos, fewer people tended to know me. Okay? So that means I can do things to act a little bit silly in those places. I can do things that make it look like I am not so good at poker. Just some kid who's splashing around. Right? 
Next, um, however, over the last three or four or five years, I go into the, any casino now, like 80% of the people know me. That means I simply do not have that opportunity to use those um, abilities. So what should we do if we do not have anything like that open to us? Well, we just have to be as reasonably strong and stoic and you know, make, make it look like we are immune to anything anyone's going to throw at us as we possibly can. And that's fine. That's, that's what I typically do anyway. So what about um, if you are a recreational player? No one knows you. Maybe you should go in there and act very amateur. That's going to make people want to play pots with you, which, you know, you want to do, especially if you're playing just, like, imagine you're a good GTO bot. You want people playing pots with you. So that's going to work out for you, right? Alexa says, any advice to avoid getting coolered? Don't play bad hands. Or realize you're gonna get you're gonna lose whenever you get coolered. You're supposed to lose whenever you make the second nuts. By the way, if you're not losing when you make the second nuts, you're probably screwing up. Unless your opponents are very bad, of course. All right, so let's say you're an older guy. Let's say you're um, I don't know, 60 years old. You don't play poker a ton. You look recreational. People are going to assume you're recreational, and there's not a whole lot you can do to change that view. There's really, really nothing you can do to change that view. Some people think, oh, I can wear sunglasses and a hoodie. I mean, you can, but you can't really do a whole lot about your appearance, right? So knowing that, what should you do? Well, if people think you're going to be maybe a little timid, maybe a little loose, timid being not so aggressive, maybe not so aggressive and a little loose, you need to play to the opposite of that. Whatever your image is, whatever people think of you, you very often need to do the opposite. There are some high-stakes pros who I know think I'm on the tighter side, who think I do not want to um, run big bluffs. I don't know why this is, but they, they seem to think it. At least that's my perception. It's very important to understand, though. Your perception, the way you view the world, is wrong. Don't forget that. You do not see everything. So, imagine people think you're on the tighter side and you just don't bluff a ton. Well, huh, loosen up just a little bit and bluff a ton. It's easy right? If people think you're going to be on the loose and aggressive side, well, maybe you need to be a little bit more, a little bit tight, a little bit passive, right? You want to try to figure out what do people expect you to do and then do the opposite, whatever that means. So the question is, how hard should you work to cultivate an image? And I'm not sure. I think I think it really depends on what your overall strategy is. Um, one person who I think is great at cultivating an image, and it works out well, is Scotty Wynn. I played with Scotty only a few times, but every time he's playing, he's drinking his ass off, he's wearing gaudy jewelry, he's talking a lot, he's joking around. When the action's on him, he looks like he's about to play his hand, he fiddles around with his cards, and then he folds. He probably plays about 8% of hands, right? Yet, he gets action as if he plays 50% of hands. And why is this? It's because he looks like he's playing hands. He legitimately looks like he is playing every single pot. And people give him action as if he is playing every single pot. But in reality, he plays like no hands. He has the nuts every time. Or at least very near the nuts. So... He has done a great job of cultivating an image, and it has worked out at least reasonably well for him. And there's a lot of work to cultivate that image. I mean, maybe that is just him, and he just happens to be a really nitty player. But I bet it, I bet there's a little bit of um, either pre-thought-out calculation there of what I'm going to do, or maybe just luckily ran into it. But it works out really well for him. You'll see a lot of the old-school live players do something like that, where they act as if they are playing a lot of hands. They try to be sort of the center of attention, but then they actually don't play very many hands. So be aware of those players. There's some players who are just, they just sit there quietly. They, they're nice, they're kind, and um, they play every single pot. <laughs> so those players, maybe you think they're, they're not so out of line, yet they're going to sit there and they're going to bluff you like crazy. I, I try to do this to some extent. <laughs> try to sit there, be nice, be jovial with everyone. They think you're not going to mess around too much, and then you mess around some. And you try to have, you try to portray the image of, no, we're nice. We don't mess around. Um, but, you know, obviously we're, we're playing a game. We're supposed to be messing around. We're supposed to be bluffing. Bill Seymour in the chat. My first poker coach. 
Hello, Bill. Hope everything's going great for you. Um, so let's talk about playing online, where it's way more difficult to develop a table image. If you're playing online, you should have a heads-up display on all the sites that allow it, because otherwise, you are essentially playing blindfolded against players who are not playing blindfolded, and that doesn't make a whole lot of sense. So, once you have played one or two orbits with a someone, it's not very long, once you've played even just a little bit with someone, my camera's tilting a little bit, once you've played a few orbits with someone, you will have stats on them. Not great stats. You'll have stats like VPIP, preflop raise, how often they defend their blind, but it really, they're, they're not good stats, right? They're very, very loose because you only have a small sample. When you have a small sample, then the numbers you get are not going to be that vital, but they are still relevant. And this is like what happens when you play live poker, right? If you're not thinking in terms of, not necessarily this guy plays 22.3% of hands, but this guy is reasonably active, or this guy is not reasonably active. Like I said earlier, the guy two to my left who didn't put a chip in the pot, well, he's probably just tight, right? So, it's important to realize that. If you're not thinking about these things at the live poker table, you are messing up. And if you are not getting as close to an accurate read online, then you're messing up. Um, that said, you know, there are some good players who are perfectly happy playing without heads-up displays. Often these are the players who don't play very many tables. Whenever you play more and more tables, you really have to lean on a heads-up display because you just aren't paying attention at all. It's just a numbers game, right? If you're playing a numbers game, then you need all the numbers you can get. If you're playing more of a game where you are trying to get very clear reads and you're trying to assume that past history indicates future actions, which sometimes it does, sometimes it doesn't, then you need to be paying very, very close attention. <laughs> so, it's all very important. Bill Seymour says, one of my leaks was I used to play bad aces. Yeah, I, I mentioned that quite often here. People always ask me some of my leaks. I used to play bad aces. ATX says, plays without HUD and doesn't pay attention. I don't know what you're referring to. But I do know in the past, I used to 24 table tournaments and just print money. Like it was insane. I would just have like 40% ROI in multi table tournaments, 24 tabling, not paying the least bit of attention. I didn't look, care who I was playing against. I only cared about their heads up display stats. And I didn't even have a ton of stats on the, on the screen. I had like 15 stats for each person. And back when everyone was not so good and it was just very obvious, this stat means this, this stat means this. It was great. Now everyone is at least kind of reasonable, so it's much more difficult to do that. You have to look more for post-flop errors, and post-flop errors do not show up on heads-up displays nearly as easily because you get a smaller and smaller sample of hands that go to the flop to turn in the river. But um, poker was great for a while. Goat says, the 2-5 you play is loaded with talented regulars. The 1-2 is terrible. I don't know what terrible means. Um, maybe that means the player's not very good. Factoring and rake, which is better? I don't know. Go experiment. Go play, right? I suggest you spend 40 hours at each. It's only one week. Go spend one week in each game. See which game you have a higher win rate at. See which game you're more comfortable in. See which game is more fun. Very often, when I used to play at Bellagio every day, I would go play um, the 5-10 game instead of the 10-20 game, where I even thought I'd have a higher win rate at 10-20, but the game was way tougher. The swings were way bigger. And um, hourly rate was only a little bit more. So it made it made sense for me to play 510, especially if I cared about variance, which, oh, variance is a tough thing. You always say you don't care, but I think everyone does care. <laughs> I mean, the, the thing is, is like if I'm playing 510, like the biggest downswing I ever had was 15K, which is almost nothing if you think about it. Like it's, it's like, it's essentially nothing. So if a big downswing is 15K, or let's say even 30K, let's say 30K, but at 1020, a biggest downswing is 100K for a slightly higher win rate. Let's say I'm going to make 120 an hour, or let's say 100 an hour at 510 and 120 an hour at 1020. Is it worth it? And I slept really well that, that year where I played only five or mostly 510 at Bellagio. It was nice. It was easy. We just printed money. Some people say, well, you're not challenging yourself. And, you know, it is important to challenge yourself to some extent. But at the same time, you don't want to do it to the point that it, it um, hinders your life. That said, I mean, like, you hear Daniel Legrandu talk about this a lot, where he says he would basically 
play buy-in for whatever. Let's just say 3060. I'm probably getting the stakes wrong. He played 3060, move up to 200, 400 or 100, 200, try to win, get crushed, move back down. Buy-in, short, you know, the small game, grind it up, play big, get crushed, move back down. Eventually, he figured it out and he moved up. I don't think it's that easy for most people. And I also don't think most people put in that much volume. I mean, I did, but I don't think most people put in that much volume. Do you change your opening ranges in cash games or tournaments depending on how active you have been? Yeah, absolutely. If you have played no hands, you should be opening a little bit wider. There was a good example of this yesterday. Let's talk about this. This is a good, great example. Um, this lady, Emma, was at the feature table of the 25K here at Bahamar in the Party Poker Tournament. And Emma also, also took second in the Montreal tournament just a few days ago. So, if you know anything about Emma, she is loose, aggressive, borderline maniacal, and that's that. She has this reputation, okay? We're going to talk about two things here, reputation and image, two different things. Okay. Her reputation is to be loose, aggressive, out of line, and maniacal. However, yesterday at the 25K which I imagine is probably a bigger tournament for her. She seems to not travel outside of Canada much. And um, here she was. If her, rep, her, her image at this table was very tight, she played 90 minutes or so and did not really put a chip in the pot. To be fair, she had bad hands. Just did not have good cards, right? But she did not really get out of line. There were a few spots where maybe she could three bet if she felt like it, and she just didn't. There were a few spots maybe she could open raise a little loose, and she just didn't right? But then after about 90 minutes, someone raised early position. She three bet with queen 10 suited. You know, again, another perfectly fine spot where you, you can three bet. There's nothing wrong with this. And she did it. Gets back around to a guy in the small blind, I think, who cold four bets with ace two suited. So think about this. Emma's played no hands in 90 minutes. To be fair, I don't know what happened before this, right? Because they only showed two hours of the feature table here at Party Poker. Um... But if she had been playing reasonably, and you know, for the last hour and a half she had played nitty, or at least it appeared as if she played nitty, she had a very tight table image. However, she still has that loose maniacal reputation, right? So two different things fighting here. She has a very loose image. I'm sorry, very tight image, very maniacal reputation. What do people default to? I mean, I can tell you, I probably would have just folded that ace who suited there. I would not have called four bet. But um that player who four bet the ace two presumably thought that Emma's reputation was way more important than her image. Or maybe that player is just a lunatic himself. Although I didn't, I don't think he was particularly maniacal. I mean, he was good, but not maniacal. But anyway, should Emma three bet that queen 10 suited there? Absolutely. Because she's been tight. She hasn't played any hands. If you haven't played any hands, you should be playing a little bit, um, t a little bit looser. If you've been playing a little bit tight, you need to be looking for spots where you can realistically get out of line without getting too far out of line, right? Like queen 10 suited. That's the spot where maybe you just fold preflop. Maybe you call preflop. Maybe you three bet preflop, right? You should probably three bet or fold though. And she picked three bet. I think it's fine. But the ace two suited was clearly an example of her reputation trumping her image. <laughs> Uncle Eddie, welcome. Good morning. Good morning. It's a Sunday today. I'm normally not here on Sundays, but I figured we might as well be here since the internet's working. All right, let's see. How do you measure success without hourly win rate? Why not use hourly win rates? Imagine you're playing... Um, <clears throat> at the end of the day, I think hourly win rate is quite, quite valuable because imagine you're playing even online and you're playing 1-2 versus 50 cent dollar, but you're playing twice as many 50 cent dollar tables. It doesn't really matter how many hands you play. It matters how, how much you make per time invested. Um, that said, obviously, amount per hand is clearly important, too. But yeah, um, you should typically measure your win rate in terms of dollars made per hand online or big blinds per hand. But ATX, get, get hold of manager. It, it solves all these problems for you. Steven says, if you're a reader of my books and you're 60 years old like Steven, you will love your image. Yeah, if I was 60 years old, I'd have all the money. <laughs> With any luck, I'll have all the money by the time I'm 60 years old. But if you're, if you're an older player, you can get away with so much, especially if you have a conservative image. If you have a maniacal image, well, maybe not so much. But if you have a conservative image, you can get away with a ton. 
How does one measure consistency? Well, you want to look at swings, right? You want to see if you are swinging all over the place. There's this idea of standard deviation, right? How much are you swinging? If you're swinging a lot, then you have a lot of variance. If you're swinging very little, you have no variance. For example, at 1020, I had a lot of variance. At 510, I had no variance. And this is over like a year long sample of live poker, which is, you know, some, but not a ton. <clears throat> Tyler says, thanks for the explanation of reputation versus image. We're here to explain and make things clear and be beneficial to all of you. So anytime we're doing that, we're doing it right. All right. Um, ATX, you should always look at it as units and not dollars. However, imagine you can win 10 units per 100 hands at one game and 7 units per hand at another game. Which one is better? And it's not necessarily just, obviously, the 10 is better. Or if the stakes are three times as much, obviously it's not 7 is better because you may be able to play way more games or way more hands of the other game. This is a problem with PLO a lot of people aren't into in that it's really hard to play a lot of hands of PLO live. If you play PLO live, you'll know it's a really, really, really slow game, and you just can't get hands in. So you can have a nice win rate, and it still doesn't make sense to play it over a different game because you just don't get to play very many hands. Is it bad to look at the push fold app in a live tournament? Is it against the rules? You're allowed to play with your phone as much as you'd like whenever you're not in a hand. So look at it before the hand starts, figure out exactly your shoving range, and then put the phone down. <laughs> and that's it. Don't use it during a hand. But, you know, look at it. Take a rough rough picture in your mind of what you need to shove with, and there you go. It's easy. What is your experience with good, solid poker players being complete degens in the pits? What is my experience? People like to gamble. Some people like to gamble more than others. How do you manage sweating when playing? You hate your sweating. I sweat a decent amount as well. I, you just have to deal with it. Just get over it. Forget about it. Ed, I don't know. As soon as, as soon as Mike and I are both free, we will try to make that video. All right. Miguel asks, with programs like Flopzilla, Equilab, ICMizer, PioSolver, Munker Solver, do we memorize these stats? You try your best to understand the principles that come from all these programs. I'm not sitting there trying to take a mental picture of every single thing I've ever, ever run because it doesn't, it, you just can't do that, right? You have to understand why you do what you do. And once you figure out why you do what you do in each spot, you're able to more easily translate the knowledge that you learn from these programs to the spots. And in reality, there's only like a thousand spots. And once you figure out how to play those thousand spots, you're going to be pretty close to right in most scenarios. Now, some of the best players in the world are going to know those spots better than you because they're just always studying it. Um, but all you can do is do your best. Please wear deodorant. Yes, obviously wear deodorant, but you have to understand deodorant does not necessarily stop sweating. I've tried all sorts of deodorants, by the way. I don't stink. I just sweat a lot because I drink a ton of water. A ton. Way more than way more water than anybody else drinks. I don't know why that is. I'm actually afraid to go on the show Survivor if I ever get invited because I drink so much water. I think I might die of dehydration. But um, I drink a whole lot of water. <laughs> Will I be at Atlantis? No, I'm not going to Atlantis this year because I'm having a baby in December. It's probably not responsible to go to the Bahamas when your, your wife has a two-year-old and a two-day-old. So we're not doing that. <clears throat> Someone says, probably diabetes. I do not have diabetes. So that's good. Let's see. You play tighter online versus live. Uh, yeah, you should play tighter online versus live for the most part because in live poker you're often playing against weaker players. And against weaker players, you should be looking for situations to play more and more hands. Um, because you're, you're going to have a win rate against the weaker players. Now, if, when you're playing against online players, often people are very good or you don't know what they're doing wrong. So that leads you to just play good, fundamentally sound poker. Kevin says, you could care less if you sweat. Kevin, I'm going to help you and everybody else out here. The phrase is, I could not care less. If you could care less, it means that you care very much about this. 
right? If you care very much about this, it means that you, this is very important to you. If you could not care less, it means that this is not important to you. And to be fair, it's a little bit annoying if you're doing a video and you're all sweaty. I mean, I'm probably sweaty right now and I'm just sitting here on the couch. If you're, if you're sweaty, it's, it's like, it's not cool, but whatever. It's fine. You just, eventually you just have to understand. Yeah, I'm playing poker and it's a stressful game and I drink a lot of water and coffee and tea and all that. And, um... It is what it is. What percent of hands are you open raising? It depends on the scenario. It depends on the game. It depends on the situation, right? Mitchum is a good deodorant. All right, I'll give it a try. World Series bans HUDs. All right, very important concept. Sites have a difficult time banning programs. And the reason is because the bad actors will often figure out how to use them. Right? So if... The, the malicious players are figuring out a way to use the programs and then the, um, the, the the good actors, the people who are obeying the rules are not using them. That gives a strict advantage to the players who are willing to cheat. And you don't want to give an obvious and huge advantage to players who are willing to cheat. And um, I mean, I know for a fact that people are using heads-up displays on the World Series sites. I just know they are. I mean, I've seen it. So... If people are doing that, what does that mean? That means that the people who are cheating are getting a significant edge, and you don't want that. So what can the sites do to prevent that? Well, they can do things like um, not give hand histories, right? They can do things like somehow make it to where they can see the programs you're using on your computer. ATX says, it's in the terms of service. Yeah, but people don't. some people don't care. Some people don't care about the terms of service. We talked about this yesterday, right? Some people just do not care about the rules. They care about making the most money possible, even if it means straight up cheating people. <laughs> so, what can they do? They can do all sorts of stuff. Um, the issue is, though, is that imagine a site bans Equilab. PokerStars bans Equilab. I know they do. And um, as you see here, Intertops probably bans these. I don't know. Maybe Party Poker does. I don't know. Imagine they ban a program, a simple program like Equilab that doesn't take anything from the computer at all. It's just a straight calculator. What's to stop me from just having another computer right here where I run Equilab? Nothing, right? So now I'm allowed, I, I am easily both allowed and incentivized to cheat, and that's not good. You don't want to incentivize people to look for obvious ways to break the rules in ways that are completely undetectable. That's a problem. And poker, poker, is gonna, is, poker is in a crappy spot in that there are a lot of programs out there. Poker is a pure math game at the end of the day. And if you are presented with programs that make the math very clean and easy, then it's, it's, a, it's very, very difficult. Site scan your PC. Exactly. They scan your PC. What about this one over here? Right? You got to think outside of the literal computer box. <laughs> And, you know, they're very easy ways to, like, mirror this computer on that computer so that, in theory, I can just have that computer up. It's like not, this is not ground-breaking breaking technology or anything. And um, it's rough. It's rough. I know one of my friends, he has, if he has this computer right here, right? And then he has loads of charts, push-fold charts, preflop-raise charts, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. And... If he had all that on his computer monitor, if he had a program that he pressed the button that it, to pull that up, it would be it would be cheating. But because it is all printed out on his wall, it's not cheating. It's the exact same information that he would get from a site. And that, that that's really the hard thing is that if there there are such obvious workarounds to this problem, and that's that gives people who are willing to do extra work a, a gigantic advantage. So. It is what it is. Be careful. Charts negate people's own ability to think. I completely disagree. There are definitively proven strategies against good players, and if you do not play fundamentally sound, you will get demolished. The biggest winners in the high-stakes games, when it's mostly good players against good players, are the players who maximally exploit the one or two bad players and the players who play closest to game theory optimal. That is how you win. And, um, you know, playing with charts and programs 
is vitally important. I know a, a poker backing site recently. I think it's called Smart Backing or something like that. They just had all their accounts banned, or most of their accounts banned on one of the main sites because they developed a program that essentially helped them with a GTO poker preflop. Why would the sites ban you if uh, you're doing something that doesn't make sense? Well, they were winning all the money, and they were playing perfectly. If you're playing perfectly preflop, you're just going to crush your opponents. And they were playing perfectly preflop, and they were crushing their opponents. So... Be careful of that. Congrats on becoming a father. Thank you. Good luck on day two. Today is day two. Oh my gosh, I should probably wake up and get going. Um, today is day two of the $25,000 tournament. I have two starting stacks. Average is a one and a half starting stacks. I have no clue how many people they're going to get for this. I think they have 250 or so right now, and they need to get 400 to meet the guarantee. 400 is a lot. <laughs> Um, I don't think they're going to get 150 more people today, which means there's probably going to be a 2 million-ish overlay in this $25,000 tournament. So that's good. <laughs> With any luck, I'll collect some of that. I don't know how much longer party poker is going to be able to do these big guarantees because they're giving away money. Um, that said, I'm very appreciative that party poker is giving away lots of money. And I'm also appreciative of the fact that they are willing to stick their neck out for the poker community. You have other sites that are putting a a 22-person guarantee on events and stuff like this. It's like, yeah, obviously you can get 20 people. You're going to get, going to get 100. And Party Poker's guaranteeing 400 people in a 25K and uh, 2,000 people in a 5K in a place like the Bahamas where there are no local players. I mean, that's just insane. And they're doing this all over the world. And I mean, they just did it in Montreal. They had a million overlay. I heard they did it in Ireland a little while before. They had a 250K overlay for a $500 tournament, right? And... um. I'm very, very happy with that. <laughs> and what they need is they need the players to support them. If you are not playing your poker on party poker, you probably should be. The games are good. They have a nice schedule. And, um, you know, they, they're, they're helping the players. You should definitely reward helping the players. ATX, you seem to be very uneducated about this topic. You need to follow it much more closely. A lot of people like to get their news from news sources that are not reputable. It's very, very important to get your news from the actual source. I'm trying to remember the guy's name who actually started the whole issue. He basically came out on it on Twitter just three or four days ago and said he was completely wrong and um, he messed up. Yet you have some people who are in the quote-unquote news who... They're actually tabloids, right? Would you ever go to the tabloid section of the grocery store, pick up a tabloid and think that this is accurate. Obviously, you would not, right? That would be really, really, really dumb. Yet, for some reason, people think that these news sources in uh, poker are accurate, and it's just not true. They are entertaining. They're for entertainment. So anyway, be, be very, very careful with who you get your news from, and realize that most people, especially on the internet are out there to provide you gossip and drama. We're not here for gossip or for drama. Party poker structures are too short. Mm, I thought they were actually pretty good. Their live tournaments are especially good. I mean, whenever I played online even, I mean, I, I bought in three hours late to a tournament yesterday. I had 50 big blinds three hours late and some $500 satellite online. So, I mean, I was very happy with that. Um, also their live tournaments, the reason they're not meeting their guarantees, if they wanted to meet their guarantees, they could, by the way, all they have to do to meet their guarantees is to let people buy in a little bit longer or have slightly worse structures. And the structures are too good. If the end of the re-entry period, you can buy in for 40 big blinds. Compare that to a place like Bellagio where you can buy in for 15 big blinds, right? Bellagio gets tons of re-entry still. They have big prize pools sometimes, depending on who gets the chips. And... Party Poker could do exactly that, but for some reason they decided not to. And I don't know why they didn't decide not to. If you're going to put a gigantic guarantee on an event, you should be looking to meet that guarantee. Or maybe they're not looking to meet the guarantee. Maybe they're just trying to give away money and get good publicity. All right. Do we play on Party Poker in the U.S.? Um, not at the moment, only in a few states. 
but you can play on it in the rest of the world. And if you're in the rest of the world, give them the support because they are the ones who are actually trying to better the poker community, not rake you to death, try to give back to you, and you need to reward that. Um, instead, what people are doing is they are playing on a few of the incumbent sites that are... that They, they have a lot of traffic. That's really the issue, is that some of the incumbent sites have a lot of traffic. Um, Party Poker does have slightly less traffic, but they won't if people start playing on it. Really as simple as that. If the games start getting bigger and bigger and bigger because people move over and play mostly on Party Poker, it will continue to grow. Party is involved in some of the independent casinos here in the UK, and their tournaments are far better than the big chains. Yeah, I mean, well, Party Poker has poker players in charge. Anytime you put poker players in charge, you can... um. You can you can expect them to, to be at least reasonable towards poker players. Does Party Poker Live play in the U.S.? I'm not sure what you're what you're asking. What do you think exploitative play is so under discussed? Why do you think exploitative play is so under discussed? Oh, I don't think it is, Thomas. That's all I teach over at PokerCoaching.com. Go to PokerCoaching.com. That's what the whole site's about. It teaches you how to play fundamentally sound and then how to adjust to take advantage of your opponents. I mean. My first book, Secrets to Professional Tournament Poker, was all about exploitative play. I said it right in the beginning. Um, I was discussing continuation betting, and I mentioned how you really don't need to be continuation betting 100%, but <clears throat> but people fold way too much. So continuation bet 100%. This was back a few years ago. But that's just like straight up exploitative play. I think a lot of people don't really understand they're talking about exploitative play. The issue is, I think, is that it's come out that the best players in the world are just trying to play strong GTO poker. And people tend to model themselves after the best in the world to the best of their ability. The problem is that those strategies will win at the smaller stakes games, but will not win as much as um, other strategies. Does Party Poker host live tournaments in the U.S.? I honestly don't know. I think they did something it. Like, they did something somewhere recently. I forget where it was. Also, Thomas, it depends on who you're talking to. Like, Daniel Negreanu's never really talked about GTO poker, right? That's a good example. Most of the old school players don't talk about GTO poker. I don't, I don't, I don't, maybe you're just going to specific news sources or strategy sources. And there are some players who primarily teach specific strategies. But, um, I don't know, maybe, maybe you need to branch out and learn from additional people or just find people who resonate with you. Yeah, if you're not facing the best opponents, you want to know what fundamentally sound poker is, and then you want to adjust from that to take advantage from them. Um, there have been a few people recently saying you don't even need to worry about GTO. And I think what they were mainly referring to is very, very technical, technically sound GTO, where you need to know to do something X percentage of the time with this hand, X percentage of the time with this hand. You don't need to do that. That's not even what I'm teaching at Poker Coaching. We're teaching a simplified version of GTO that you can actually implement. Because a strategy is no good if you can't implement it. But um, you need to know where to adjust from. Otherwise, you won't know where to adjust to, right? And if things are going poorly when you do adjust, you won't know where to adjust back to. I think a lot of people get in their minds, I'm just going to go sit down and figure it out at the table. GTO stands for Game Theory Optimal. Game Theory Optimal strategies exist for most games, or probably all games, really. I mean, you see basketball now being taken over by GTO play. Everyone now either dunks it or shoots uh, shoots three pointers, right? They didn't. They didn't do that just a few years ago. GTO is taking over. Which learning products do I recommend? PokerCoaching.com. It's not perfect GTO, but it's implementable GTO. Remember, you want to be able to implement whatever strategy you are using. Great webinar with Alex Fitzgerald the other day. Good. I'm glad that you signed up. If you all missed that webinar with Alex Fitzgerald, it was completely free. I put it out there for all of you. Alex was very nice to do it. Um, you can still probably get the replay if you haven't signed up for my email list at um, jonathanlittlepoker.com. So go do that. And he says, you should really be doing your poker coaching homework. I should really do it too. I don't think I've made mine yet. <laughs> but here we are. Fish says, you know GTO for Monopoly. Yeah, maybe you do. A lot of people know GTO for most games. I mean... 
Tic-tac-toe, right? You all know GTO for tic-tac-toe. You never lose a tic-tac-toe. You either break even or you win. It's not hard. It takes you like 20 minutes to figure it out. Then you have games like Connect 4, where GTO is not so hard. Then you have games like Checkers and then Chess. There is GTO for Chess. Then you have games like Poker. Poker is tough because there's unknown information. In game, most of the other, all the other games I just mentioned, all the information is known. But in poker, the information is not all known, and that's what makes it difficult. All right, we're done for the day. What are we going to talk about tomorrow? I have a few topics. If you all have any topics you want me to discuss, feel free to send me an email. If you're on my email list, just click reply to any email. I see all of them. I have a few, I have a few topics here. I have to decide which one I want to talk about. Frank says Batgammon compares. Yeah, Batgammon does compare. Batgammon is like easy poker. Um, Batgammon has been essentially solved, and you're going to find that... So Batgammon is a really good example of what may happen to poker one day. Hopefully it doesn't, but maybe it will. Where the game used to be a big gambling game, but computers came in and solved it. And it turns out just rolling dice is actually pretty easy to, to solve for. There aren't that many possible outcomes. And... Batgammon is dead now. They don't play Batgammon for big money anymore because some people have brains like computers. And you don't want to play against computers. <laughs> and you can't play online because the person, you know, the person you're playing against may be attached to a computer. This happened with old school Chinese poker where you just played 13 card, high, high, high hand. I knew the game perfectly. My game, my, my, it's not a hard game to solve. I played it perfect GTO. And eventually people won't play with you anymore or they'll invent a new game. They did Deuce to Seven in the middle. Then we solved that. Then they started doing this pineapple stuff, and now it becomes way more difficult. So we don't play anymore. Why do I coach? Because I like helping people. Some people just like helping people. I know, I know we're in a world where most people are just out for themselves and are trying to better their own lives only. But that's not what I'm doing. I'm here to help people. I have been helped by so many people throughout my life. Some people don't even know they've helped me. Like I mentioned yesterday, I listened to a ton of podcasts. And those people don't know that they've helped me. Some of them I, I've told and I've interacted with them. But without their help, I would certainly not be where I am today. And if I can help any of you in any way whatsoever, I am happy to help you too. In, in poker and in life. I mean, I'm certainly not the best at either. But I'm probably better than some. And if, you know, all you have to do is be a little bit better than some and you can help out people. How do we handle taking second place in a tournament where you could have gotten first and there's a big pay difference? I mean, you just got to deal with it. Sometimes you're going to win, sometimes you're going to lose. Is it more for helping people than for profit? It's both. I mean, to be fair, you're going to find the people who do the best work would be doing the work that they do for free. I would be doing everything I do for free. Um, I mean, I like playing poker. I like helping all of you. And that's why um, I think I've been reasonably successful at it. If I did not like helping people and if I did not like playing poker, well, I probably would not be successful at it, right? So you need to find things that you like, find things that you enjoy, and then do them. A lot of people always ask me, or they come up to me, they say, I'm thinking about writing a book, but I don't know if I'm going to make any money from it. I'm like, well, I, I, I basically had my first book written. I didn't expect to make any money from it at all. I, I did it because I loved it because I wanted to, right? Find projects that you are passionate about and do, do those projects because it doesn't matter if they succeed or not. You're doing them for you and because you enjoy doing them. If you enjoy what you're doing, you're going to be fine. You may not, may not get rich, but you'll be happy, and, and happiness is quite valuable. All right. Have a good day. He's been going way, way too long. <laughs> um, let me know if you want me to keep these shorter, like 30 minutes. Someone suggested that. Someone said longer. Who knows? I don't know what I'm doing here. I'm just here because I enjoy being with all of you. All right, have a great day. Good luck. Follow me on Instagram and Twitter and all that. Press like, press subscribe, press retweet, press whatever you can press. And have a great day.